Okay, so uh, everyone, uh, uh, thanks for joining us uh, from different uh, time zones of the world. Uh, for us, it's uh, almost uh, 10 30, in Pakistan, it's 9 30. Today, we have uh, Andrew Meek uh, from Oregon State University, USA. And he'll be talking about active tectonics and earthquake geology of northwestern Himalayas. So, we are uh, uh, about to start this talk tonight. Uh, before that, I just like to remind the people and let the people know who just joined us. Uh, we had a talk by Peter Clift, who talked about tectonic climate control and sediment flux to the index submarine fan. Uh, then we had before that Rajiv Patnik from India, who talked about stratigraphic and paleoecological importance of the neogene. We had Kathleen Bajlai. Uh, we had Hamad Rani. Uh, Kathleen talked about uh, from fossils to ecosystems in Shivalik's record of Pakistan. So if you were interested to see the previous talk, uh, I would really... give those talks because I'm providing links to those talks in this email. So I will now let Bob uh, with the program and introduce the speaker for tonight's talk. Paul, over to you. Yep. Thank you very much, Irfan. And uh, I want to also shout out to Mukti Argani, who is in Quetta, uh, who is helping to coordinate the uh, Microsoft Teams programming tonight, uh, this morning in Pakistan and tonight uh, in Denver, where I'm located. Uh, this uh, seminar series has been going on. I think we're on our number 10 talk right now. And uh, we've got next week, uh, we're going to have Kay Berensmeyer from the Smithsonian Institution. And uh, we've got other people scheduled, including uh, Jason Head uh, from Cambridge and Lisa Tauks from uh, Santa Cruz. And uh, we've got Peter Zeitler coming, Turi Serling is coming, uh, Yanni uh, Na Na Naiman is coming. And uh, we've got a, uh, Javed Khan who worked on the Transindus. And we've also got a uh, fellow, uh, Path. Chandahar from India, who will be coming talking about hominid fossils in the Shivaliks. Uh, tonight, we're going to have the opportunity to hear Andrew Miggs from Oregon State University uh, give a talk on uh, uh, earthquakes and seismology and structural geology uh, in the Potwar area. And uh, Andrew is a uh, uh, he's a, a student of, of, of my classmate, uh, Doug Burbanks, from, and uh, got his PhD in, in the University of Southern California, working in uh, the Juwalamukhi area. Andrew measured one of the longest paleomagnetic sections in, in, in South Asia. <laughs> it might have been <laughs> one of the longest paleomagnetic sections in the world at the time it was done. I think it's being rivaled in Nepal right now, Andrew. You've got to check that out. Uh, Back to work. Yeah. <laughs> but then uh, Andrew uh, went to Oregon State University, uh, again, working with several friends and colleagues of mine, uh, and uh, he's been there uh, since 1998 working on, on seismology and earthquake uh, tectonics in, uh, in uh, Kashmir uh, and uh, northwestern uh, Himalayas. So, uh, Andrew, we're going to turn it over to you, and uh, you'll have time for questions and answers uh, following Andrew's talk. So, Andrew, take it away. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn off. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bob, Mukhtar, and Irfan. I'm going to just get myself situated here uh, to share the screen, and then we'll get going. Uh, hang on a sec. Sorry about this. I thought I had it all worked out, but <clears throat> I'll be ready to go in a moment, everyone. Yeah, no, no trouble. While, while you're putting your uh, uh, act, your story together there on the uh, screen share, I just want to mention that we've got, uh, we really have five or six people already scheduled and lined up, and then we've got four or five people who are who have expressed interest, and we're we're nailing down uh, dates. So the seminar series is likely to go. Uh, well into June and perhaps into July, and uh, perhaps it'll be endless. So <laughs> we don't know <laughs> quite how far. It goes. Yeah. But uh, so Andrew, we're seeing your, your uh, first slide very nicely right now. 
Okay, very yeah. good. Thank now you. I can so see some collaborators from Peshawar University. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> That's good. Do you, want me to, to see Irfan, do you want me to move them up a little higher? <laughs> 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 All right, everybody. Uh, the first thing I want to do before I have two things I, I would like to just say before I get started with the sciencey part of the talk. But the first of all is I would like to say to all of our my Pakistani friends and our Pakistani colleagues that Bob Yates um, sends his warmest wishes to all of you. He turned 90 years old about two weeks ago. And oh, his, okay. he, he has uh, memory issues, unfortunately, which are making oh. it difficult for him to participate in events such as this. But everyone who knows Bob uh, knows he would never miss a chance to do this sort of thing if, if the opportunity presented himself. So I'm saying hello on Bob's behalf to all of you. And Bob <clears throat> was organized, was part of a group of people including the other Bobs from Oregon State, Bob Lawrence and Bob, um, oh, okay, I've just had a memory Lily. lapse. Thank you. Lily. Thank you, Mukhtar. Uh, Bob Lilly, who uh, worked in Pakistan for more than 10 years, involved uh, students from Pakistan, including um, Shaheed Beg here in the front. Um, and Bob introduced me to many, many important uh, Pakistani colleagues, including Dr. Kazim John, Dr. Asif Khan, Dr. Mona Lisa, Dr. Kosar, and uh, and Ahmed Hussein, who is here in in the background, and and I learned a lot from all of these people, and I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to meet with with all of you. Okay, the other thing I want to say is that in the very first talk I heard, which was by Gary Johnson, he mentioned that uh, that Dr. Tar Kelly. Uh, was a mentor of his who taught him many things, among which were the keeping of impeccable field notes and sample locations. And so I, it dawned on me at that time that basically there's a lineage from Dr. Kel Tara Kelly to Gary Johnson to Doug Burbank to me and now my student Ellen Lamont down here on the right-hand side uh, of knowledge transfer that is related to the great relations that we've had between the Pakistani science community and the U.S. science community. Uh, and I feel like I'm a very tiny part of that lineage. But I also am glad to know um, Gary's story because it explains to me why I was so nervous about making sample location maps as a graduate student, because there was this, this a sort of an insistence coming down from the, from the pillars of science that uh, this should be done. And, and, I, and I understand why, and I'm glad to be part of that tradition. This picture is of Ellen and I at an outcrop where we, where we made a, a mark that looked like the ones I made when I sampled the Jawalamuki section to, to show to, to Doug to say that the, the sample, you can still resample if necessary. Okay, on to tonight's topic, which is really going to be a departure from what we've heard so far in the series. Uh, the, the series has showcased the remarkably rich record of, of Himalayan tectonics, space and evolution, paleoenvironmental and faunal change, and many other topics contained within the Shawalak sedimentary sequence. I, I would posit, or I would hazard to say that, in fact, it's structural geology which has made that all possible because deformation of the Foreland Basin and the Shawalak rocks has, in fact, re revealed that long record. <clears throat> Earthquakes such as the devastating 2005 Kashmir event demonstrate, however, that convergence continues. And my talk tonight is going to be about how active tectonics and earthquake and geology can help to inform both our understanding of how mountain building occurs, but also about seismic hazards. And what I hope to do uh, uh, is tonight in my talk is to first provide a framework for understanding earthquake generation so that we all have a kind of a common vocabulary as, as I show you the data that uh, my students and the students of my uh, close collaborator, Doug Yule, have collected over the years. And then I'm going to show you where and at what rates active faulting is currently occurring uh, in parts of the Northwest Himalaya where we've worked. And that 
uh, I'm going to conclude with identifying or talking a little bit about where work is needed to improve our understanding of earthquake hazards because the people of Pakistan and the other nations that are distributed along the Himalaya are exposed to a very substantial and ongoing uh, uh, seismic hazard. So if you look in the first slide here, I'm hoping you're seeing a colorful geophysical image of the India-Asia collision. And we can just look at the bottom in which you can see India is this blue plate and it is being subducted, as we all know, underneath the edge of the Himalaya and Tibet. <clears throat> The most significant fault in the entire system is the so-called main Himalayan thrust fault, which is in effect the plate boundary between India and Asia. The plate boundary uh, has generated most of the all or nearly all of the significant earthquakes in the Himalaya, uh, both in the historically documented record, which are in the red ellipses, and the paleoseismologically established documented record, which are in the yellow ellipses. And what I would just show you here is that within that record, we can see that most of the plate boundary, with a few exceptions here in the east near the Shillong Plateau and up here in the Pakistan and northwestern Himalayan region, have ruptured in very large earthquakes. Very large, meaning the largest ones are in the magnitude eight and a half or larger range. And these are of the biggest earthquakes that we know that occur on the planet. If you want to know about how to translate geology into meaningful information about earthquakes, you, you have to go back to the work that was done after the 1906 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault in Korea of the USA in which there was a big private study that was funded immediately after the earthquake to study the effects of the event. And one of the most important discoveries that came out of that study, of that work, was the, the findings of, of a geophysicist named H.F. Reed, who postulated that things like the offset of this fence, which occurred in the, in the, in the 1906 earthquake, were in fact the, the inevitable consequence of a cycle of the storage of energy that is released in earthquakes. So if we want to know about how to approach the earthquake problem, understanding H.F. Reed's elastic rebound theory is important. The theory goes something like this, and I decided to just make a hand-drawn sketch because this is the way I might do it in, in a class. And, and it's, a, it's a very simple uh, concept on one level. If we if we if we have a period of time just after an earthquake, and we construct, let's say, some kind of a marker like this road across a fault. And here I'm showing a a strike slip fault to mimic the kind of ideas that Reed was talking about in the early 20th century. In between earthquakes, the storage of energy builds up. Uh, the potential for the future rupture during what is called the interseismic period, the period of time between earthquakes. And during that interval of time, the earth is distorted around a fault, but is not offset by it. The offset across the fault occurs when the strength of that material is exceeded by the stored energy and an earthquake pops off. And the earth behaves to a first order in an elastic way, such that it recovers its shape. You see the distortion is gone, but now the offset of the road is permanently etched into the Earth's surface as a displacement, and we call that co-seismic time. And what Reed conceptualized was, there was, was that there was a cycle around stress, which is that term tau here, where there is a period of loading, the interseismic time, and then the earthquake is essentially an instantaneous event that releases that stress. And the next earthquake is created by loading and unloading in the earthquake and so forth and so on, such that if we have a fault like the one pictured at the top and we plot displacement versus time, earthquakes look like a displacement event and interseismic time look like no increase in displacement. And, and over some period of time, we capture 
the displacement on the fault as a function of the combination of both the earthquake slip and the interval to, of time between those earthquakes. And if we have enough displacement, we can measure the slip rate, for example, on a fault. And in the way, in a, in a perfectly periodic model, such as the one I have up here, where, where there's interseismic, co-seismic, interseismic, co-seismic, and onward and onward, the loading rate of the fault as indicated by the slope of this curve in interseismic time ought to be matched by the long-term slip rate of the fault. And this provides a framework, therefore, by which we can look at the geological record because we can look at, for example, successively offset features to calculate slip. And if we know their age, we can determine time. And if we have enough of that information, we can look at slip rate. In contrast, if we are in interseismic time, as we are now most of the time, in fact, is interseismic time, the loading rate as given by the distortion of that fault is indicated by the slope of this curve. So if we have a way of measuring the distortion of the earth, we have a way of understanding what loading rates are. And thus, we can work back and forth between things that constrain what is happening interseismically to things that happen during earthquakes. And in, in in, in the ideal case, they serve as checks and balances on one another. The other critical part about earthquakes and hazards, especially associated with places where continental collision is occurring, such as in the Himalaya, is that there are basically two parts of faults. There is the shallow part of the fault, which is depicted here as that part of the fault zone above a temperature of about 300 degrees centigrade. And there is the deep part of the fault, which is that part of the fault zone that extends below this 450 degree C part of the fault zone. And I, I note this distinction because it is above this temperature range of about 300 degrees C where most earthquakes nucleate and they rupture towards the Earth's surface generally. Sometimes they rupture down as well. But generally speaking, we're talking about the upper part of this diagram is where the co-seismic displacement occurs. And it is the lower part of the diagram in which interseismic strain accumulation loads the fault, which leads to an earthquake. And I emphasize this point because if we want to figure out where faults are <clears throat> accumulating strain, we have to look at parts of faults that are relatively deep. That is to say, in, in at temperatures of 300 degrees C or higher, because it is that part of the fault which is continuously slipping and storing and, and transferring or storing strain to the shallow part of the fault. So how does this, what does this look like in the Himalaya? Well, if we take a cross section through Nepal, and this is often shown because there's a very, there's a reasonably good understanding of both the interseismic and the co-seismic uh, time frames in Nepal. But here's the foreland on the left-hand side the Tibetan plateau on the right-hand side, and the plate boundary, the main Himalayan thrust is this black line which turns red down here. So in interseismic time, the way the Himalaya works, at least on the main Himalayan thrust, is that the deep part of the fault is continuously creeping up to where that star is, where it changes from a fault which is moving all the time to one which is quote-unquote locked. It is storing energy in anticipation of the future earthquake, Co-seismic time is that short interval of time in which the main Himalayan thrust moves in large earthquakes. This transition point between the deep part and the shallow part is often called the locking line, and we'll return to this, but you'll notice that in Nepal, the depth of this locking line is in the 10, 10 to 15 kilometer depth range. And thus, to find out how the a fault is behaving, we need to understand where it's storing strain and where it releases. The, the vexing part, the most complicated part is that interseismic time uh, is typically measured in hundreds to thousands of years, whereas co-seismic time is measured on seconds to minutes. So there's a huge scale difference in time between these two, but what earthquake geology does seeks to do is to try to relate these two to one another in terms of the amount of slip 
and the rate at which faults move during co-seismic time. And in Nepal, this is pretty well established. In Nepal, <clears throat> these are this is a map showing, of course, the Indian subcontinent. And you can see these yellow arrows here are velocity vectors of stable India with respect to stable Eurasia, showing that in the Indian plate is converging in the neighborhood of 35 to 30 millimeters per year with respect to Asia. But of that convergence, only a, a fraction of that is going into building the Himalaya. And in Nepal, a fraction means somewhere between about 19 and 25 millimeters per year is absorbed in the shortening within the Himalaya. So in interseismic time, what that means is that if we look at that same cross-section we we're looking at before, where the forelands on the left and Tibet is on the right, one of the methods that we can use to find this gradient in strain that shows loading on a fault is the horizontal velocity measured from the global positioning system instruments. And that gradient in Nepal shows about a 15 to 20 millimeter a year gradient between the rate at which a station is moving in Tibet or South Tibet with respect to stable India and a station over here uh, within the Himalaya is moving within, with respect to stable India. And that gradient ties directly to the locking line, which is related to the continuously slipping part of the fault. So in, in Nepal, the main Himalayan thrust is loading the shallow part of the fault at a rate of about 15 to 20 millimeters per year. If you go to the main frontal thrust, the frontal part of the Himalaya, this is where we would expect to see the effects of co-seismic deformation. And if you do this cross section, there's the main frontal thrust, and this would all be Shawalik strata back here, which are, make a very simple thrust sheet that dips towards the north with the main Himalayan thrust here, climbing to the surface and then coming to the surface as the main frontal thrust. River terraces that are 10,000 years and younger are uplifted. So for example, we just take the oldest one here. It's, it's uplifted at its highest point with respect to river level by about uh, let's say uh, 50 to 60 meters. And that uplift can be translated into a shortening rate across the main frontal thrust that equals approximately 19 or so millimeters per year, meaning that almost all of the strain that is stored on the main Himalayan thrust in inner seismic time, at least in the Holocene, is being taken up by slip all the way up to the main frontal thrust. And that is the primary active structure in Nepal. That structure periodically ruptures to the Earth's surface. This is a, uh, a, a natural exposure on a river bank, which shows a river terrace, a young river terrace that is marked by this blue line here that is uplifted about seven meters with respect to the modern wash. And when you resolve for the slip on the main frontal thrust that is required to uplift this terrace, you get an earthquake in 1100 AD that probably had the on order of 17 meters of slip in that one event. And that 17 meters of slip represents the net stored accumulated strain since the last earthquake. So if we think about Nepal, we say that the Himalaya, the, the, the plate motion of India with respect to Asia is being stored on the deep part of the Himalayan, main Himalayan thrust, which periodically ruptures to the surface along the Himalayan frontal thrust. The part of the world that we're gonna talk about tonight is up here in, in, in Northwest Himalaya and in Pakistan where these same uh, um, uh, measurements of what is the long-term or the, the Holocene or quaternary rate of motion and the earthquake history is considerably less constrained than it is down in Nepal. So what I hopefully will show you is in two transects, what are the active structures and that are absorbing the convergence 
at what rate are they moving, and to what extent do we know the paleo earthquake history of any of them? Because that is the key question in seismic, one of the critical questions to understand or characterize seismic hazard. This is a, a map of the, the Northwest Himalaya, Kashmir, Pakistan region, and the border runs down through here, as, as is well known. And I've left the border off to emphasize that the, all of these red lines are known active structures. And <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is go through a, a set of studies that were done by two graduate students, one Jan Gavio and the other Chris Madugo, who got their PhDs at Oregon State. And, and the undergraduate research of Aaron Hebler, who got his master's degree working on the Riasi Fault, paleoseismic history. And then I'm gonna to turn to the, the salt range thrust and finally to the Balakot Bog Fault, which generated the 2005 earthquake. So the first thing we're gonna do is go sequentially from the fold at the deformation front in the northwestern Himalaya to the Riasi thrust, which is the long strike equivalent of the Balakot bog fault, and then into the Kashmir Basin. So here's Jan, uh, I, uh, working in fact uh, in the field area uh, as a graduate student, and this is a cross section that he developed across the Himalaya, which shows the foreland, the undeformed foreland on the south to the Kashmir Basin on the north. And the, the key features of the cross section that I want you to see are that the deformed Shawalak foreland consists of a anticline, the Surin Mastagar anticline, several other folds, a large thrust, the Riasi thrust, which places the Sirbon limestone, Cambrian limestone over the Shawalak strata. And then there are Donnerham solid rocks present back here, the main boundary thrust, the main central thrust across the Pir Punjal range into the Kashmir Basin. The main Himalayan thrust is entirely at depth here, which goes from a depth of about five kilometers beneath the Surin Mastagar anticline to greater than 15 kilometers below the Kashmir Basin in this cross section. And I point that out because the, ge the geodetic velocity vectors <clears throat> from two studies, one by a, a woman named Celia Schiffman, who was a student of Roger Billiam, and another by uh, Dr. Kundu, shows that there's about 11 millimeters a year of convergence between the high Himalaya and the undeformed foreland across the Northwest Himalaya. Another way to say that is that we should expect to see, if we know all of the active structures, we should be able to recapture something in the neighborhood of 10 or 11 millimeters per year of shortening on all of the major active structures. And so as I said a moment ago, what we're gonna do here is first look at the SMA, then we'll look at the Riasi fault, and then finally we'll look at active faults on the southern edge of the Kashmir Basin. All right, the, the, the Surin Maskar anticline is very well expressed topographically. This is a, a map um, of the uh, the Chenab River comes down through here, and the anticline is in this white axial trace running down through the uh, middle of the photo or of the to of the digital topography. This is Upper Shawalak and Middle Shawalak rocks exposed on the limb of the anticline, and there's a lot of interesting features associated with this anticline. It's a complex structure. These are three serial cross sections that are showing the deformed Shawalak sediment in the light orange colors and the Dharamsala or the Murray's equivalent in these darker colors at depth. And the main feature to note is that the, beneath the, the SMA, there are a series of thrust faults that are all related to the main Himalayan thrust at depth. And thus the anticline is related to thrust tectonics in the deep subsurface that are duplicating the, the Dharam the uh, Dharamsala section. There's plenty of evidence that the, Sur that the SMA is actively growing. Here's just one of them that we uh, have an image we produced in Google Earth, which shows more steeply dipping uh, upper Shawalak 
that are unconfirmably overlain by less tilted fans or, or upper uppermost shawalik. And you can see that bedding, for example, is unconfirmably overlain by less tilted rocks over here. So there's growth of this structure during the deposition of upper shawalik and younger beds. And that kind of active growth is also indicated by the deformation of river terraces, which are etched across the anticline. So this is a map that from Jan Gavio's dissertation, which shows fluvial terraces of different ages where yellow is the oldest and uh, this dark green is the youngest terrace at the lowest elevation. And these terraces are folded across the SMA axis, which is shown right going through right through here in the middle of the of the anticline. Here's but just one field uh, image from, from Jan's work, which shows uh, a, 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 a river terrace elevated with respect to the modern channel in the near the core of the SMA. And in the background, what you see are a steeply tilted middle Shawalik rocks. Thus, this terrace is evidence that there is continued growth of this fold even into the quaternary, which is causing uplift and abandonment of terraces. And this is um, a profile of those terraces going up and over the, uh, the anticline. And what you see are that terraces T1, for example, which is the oldest, is higher and more tilted than older terraces such as T2 and the youngest terraces at the river bottom. Now, in order to figure out the age of these terraces, Jan employed two different methodologies. One is beryllium 10 cosmogenic surface exposure methodology, and then the optically stimulated luminescence method to figure out the age of abandonment of the terrace from the beryllium data and the date of aggradation of material on top of the bedrock unconformity with optically stimulated luminescence. And there's simply not enough time to explain either the methodologies or the problems with them because they, they aren't simple to apply to geomorphology. But when you apply these age constraints to these terrace data, you come up with a <clears throat> shortening rate across the surin mastgar anticline, which is in the neighborhood of six millimeters per year, averaged for the three principal terraces that can be mapped across the anticline over a period of about 40,000 years or 50,000 years. And what's interesting about that particular result is when you compare that shortening rate of about six millimeters per year, as indicated by the green uh, swath here with the dash line in the middle, and compare that to Jan's other work that show, is showing the long-term evolution of the SMA as constrained by uranium thorium helium dating of the same type that Ahmad Ghani described about a month ago. Uh, you get actually shortening rates on long time scales that are about the same as what we see on the on the tens of thousand of year time scales. The important point really, however, is that about half of the convergence of South Tibet with respect to the Indian foreland is absorbed at the deformation front, which means there are other active structures to account for the missing other half of the shortening. And the main fault system that is capturing that missing shortening is the Riasi thrust system. The Riasi thrust is mapped regionally as separating the Precambrian Serbon limestone, which I'm pretty sure is the age equivalent of the Muzaffarabad limestone in Pakistan with respect to deformed Shawalik rocks, which are shown uh, are, I guess they're not differentiated on the map, and, um, and terrace deposits. And the Riasi Fault in, near the town of Riasi itself consists of two strands, the main Riasi thrust, which is the one placing the carbonate against the Shawalik or other surficial deposits, and the frontal Riasi thrust, which is a splay off of that structure. The Faults are exceptionally well exposed. These are pictures from a paper by Jan in 2016, which show uh, 
the Precambrian Serbon limestone core mountains thrust over the uh, surficial deposits, terraces, and shawalik of the footwall. If we look in detail, the main Riasi thrust is here in the lower left, and it is a steeply dipping fault that is unconformably overlain by this T5 deposit. And that's important because the frontal Riasi thrust, in contrast, cuts all of the surficial deposits and goes right up to the Earth's surface. Thus, the currently active strand of the Riasi thrust system is the frontal Riasi thrust. And I, I, should, I would be remiss if I didn't also note that there's a French group led by, by uh, Professor Mounier, who has also worked in the same area. They refer to this fault as the rain fault, but they're the same structure we yeah, had the, the you can you can see the literature. There are some differences of opinions about how the faults work, but in general, the basic structure is agreed upon between our two groups. Here is a cross section, two cross sections of a larger scale cross section showing the Sirbon limestone thrust against uh, Upper Shawalik here with surficial deposits over. Um, draping over these folded uh, shawalik deposits. And then a detail showing that the main Riasi thrust is unconformably overlain by about a 50,000 year old deposit, whereas the frontal Riasi thrust cuts all up to and includes the Earth's surface. And in the master's thesis of Aaron Hebler uh, from Cal State Northridge, one of Doug Yule's students, uh, in a huge trench that we dug across the Riasi Fault, we were able to demonstrate that there are a suite of tilted gravels here in purple that are age range from 4,500 to 9,000 years old that are unconformably overlain by a package of rocks given by these yellow colors, unit five and unit six that are 4,500 years or younger. And what we infer this to mean is that we captured at least one paleo earthquake on the Riasi Fault, which must have occurred prior to about 4,500 years ago. Now, if we turn to the Kashmir Basin in the farthest north part of this transect, this is a map from Chris Madugo's PhD dissertation, in which he shows the ma his map distribution of the so-called Balpora fault system, which it marks the southern boundary of the of the Kashmir Basin and deforms terraces that are coming off the Pir Panjal range and draining into the central Kashmir Basin. The Kashmir Basin is a it has a known earthquake history that includes an earthquake in in the late 1800s that it was in the magnitude six range. And so Chris went here to investigate the degree to which we could know whether this fault system was associated with that particular earthquake and older faults. Chris dug a trench across the fault system, which in which he uncovered two strands of the fault. FZ3 is down here on the south, FZ2 and one are on the north. And from those he logged the stratigraphy of the surficial deposits directly across the fault trace. And I'm gonna show you a blow up of that simply to say a, 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 a little bit more about paleoseismology. Paleoseismology is something that is uh, a, a very detailed way of doing something that we learned when we were young geologists. That is the law of cross-cutting relationships. In, in, in this trench, it beautifully illustrates, for example, a, a unit number 400 here at the top, and it unconformably overlies a tilted unit number 300, which is cross-cut by one of the strands of fault zone number three. So from the paleoseismological point of view, what we have here is a earthquake event, an earthquake event which is recorded by the tilting of unit 300 and the offset of the contact between unit 300 and the underlying unit below. And we know that that was a discrete event because the unconformity at the top of 300 or the base of 400 is a better way to say it, is not deformed. And that brackets the age of that event. 
if you in your mind's eye, if you're able to do this and take the green line and just slip it back to its counterpart here on the other side of the fault, you see that when you go into the deep part of the trench, that doesn't restore all of the slip on the fault, nor does the uplift that's associated with unit 300 restore the fold that's down below. And that provides evidence for a second earthquake event in the deeper part of the stratigraphy. So this particular trench has a two event chronology. If you combine it with the other trench that's farther along on this on that on that profile that I showed initially, Chris can document three paleo earthquakes at the boundaries between these principal units, unit 400, unit 300, and at the 100, 200 contact since about 25,000 years ago. And this gives a, this is a, not a lot of events to make this generalization, but a return period of earthquakes in the Kashmir Basin that are on the order of tens of thousands of years, which equates to a slip rate that is on the order of a few, uh, of, of less than a millimeter per year. So what we can conclude, and I, I failed to say this when I was talking about the Riasi fault, the Riasi fault is moving at about six millimeters a year given our, the age and terrace relations that I described. You can say that in the northwestern part of the Himalaya that the, the SMA absorbs about six millimeters per year. The Riasi fault absorbs about six millimeters per year, and the Kashmir Basin faults absorb a millimeter or probably much less than a millimeter a year of slip, such that the geological rates that we measure in the quaternary on this set of faults matches fairly closely to the loading rate that we measure from GPS here. If we turn to the salt range, uh, we see a much less well-resolved history, but evidence of paleo earthquake deformation. And the, we, we focused on the salt range because this is the deformation front of the Himalaya in Pakistan. And if Nepal is a, is a, uh, uh, a guide for what we might expect, we might expect that the deformation front is the most active uh, that we would expect to see related to Himalayan collision. So in Chris's thesis, <clears throat> he has a very nice chapter which describes the kinematic and geologic evidence for active slip on the Kalabog Fault. Now the Kalabog Fault, as is well known, is essentially a tear fault that links the salt range thrust to the neighboring thrust farther to the west uh, by allowing the salt range to advance to the south relative to the um, part of the undeformed foreland off to the west side of the fault. And that idea is captured in these two pictures up here on the right, and that is to say that the salt range is a thrust fault. The northern block is moving south with respect to the Indian or the Pakistani foreland, excuse me. And when that occurs, then we would expect that the thrust front should move progressively south. Chris, and I think in part because he had a long uh, and very successful career as a consultant working on strikes of faults, realized that the earthquake record for the Sol range is not at the front, but is on the Kalabog fault. Because if this kinematic model is correct, Every time the, the salt range moves south, there should be shear along the Kalabog fault margin. And thus, if you look in detail, as we're going to shortly at the geomorphology here on the, uh, across the Kalabog fault, you can find good evidence for lateral slip in, uh, along the fault. The evidence is this. There are a series of alluvial fans that go from QF1 three and four from old to young, which are apparently offset with, res with respect to potential source areas. Here, the options are canyons one or two. And so the idea here is basically, if you take QF1, that it must have a source area because it's not lined up with a canyon now. It must have been displaced relative to its source area as the salt range moved to the south on the east side of the Kalabog Fault from either this canyon number one 
or canyon number two. And using those constraints, you can measure the amount of offset of the fan with respect to the canyon. And using the age constraints, you can say something about the rate of motion across the Calibog fault. So given those range of options, the Calibog fault is moving somewhere between one and seven millimeters per year. <clears throat> And we prefer the higher number principally because uh, the long-term slip rate on the salt range thrust is in the 7 to 10 million meters per year, uh, depending on what source you read. Now, here's a picture of Chris in the field. And I show you this because this is a beautiful outcrop of the Calabog Fault where it cuts right up to the Earth's surface. Here's a fault strand running right down through the outcrop. And you can see a series of other fractures that are running through here. And this is evidence of brittle deformation of surficial deposits at the Earth's surface due to slip on the Calabog Fault. Is it earthquake slip? Well, that is really the most highly debated question because of course, the salt range thrust is a fast moving fault and it roots directly into the main Himalayan thrust. Here's an outcrop picture that contains evidence for, almost certainly contains evidence for two paleo earthquakes. One of the paleo earthquakes is indicated by these fissures, which are instantaneous fractures that are commonly associated with strike slip earthquakes that then fill up with sediment that piles into those fissures after the uh, fissures have formed during seismic slip. Above those, there are faults that project above into the sediment. And the, the key relation here is that the fissure opens in one event, it fills up with material that is then subsequently faulted in a younger event. So there may be evidence for at least two paleo earthquakes here. The youngest paleo earthquake is probably constrained by the age of this sediment at 6,000 years and by these Hindu temples that are right on the Indus River that are made of brick. They're, they're simply um, earthen structures, brick structures that are freestanding. And Chris reasons that the fact that they're a very fragile kind of construction and that they're still standing between 1.4 and 1.6 thousand years after being constructed is indicative of no strong seismic shaking since that time. And from these data, he therefore concludes that there is a paleo earthquake recorded on the Calabog Fault and therefore the salt range thrust sometime between 6,000 and 1.4 thousand years ago. Finally, if we turn to the Balakot Bog Fault very quickly, uh, the Balakot Bog Fault is part of the same thrust system as the Riasi Fault. It separates at the surface the, the Muzaffarabad limestone from either Shualik or MBT rocks, depending on where you are along the fault trace. The earthquake nucleated at depths of about 12 kilometers and ruptured up a thrust fault to the Earth's surface, as is well known. Immediately after the earthquake, a team of Japanese scientists uh, partnered with the GSP to dig trenches across the Balakot Bog Fault. And these are graphics from their trenches, not the actual trenches, not the actual pictures of the trenches themselves. But these are the faults here in red. And the sediments that were deformed in the 2005 earthquake are these purple colored rocks, including the rupture to the Earth's surface uh, on this strand right up here. And that you can use these trench logs to reconstruct paleo earthquakes by removing 2005 earthquake deformation. And that show, is shown here where all of the units that were deformed in 2005 are restored back to horizontal, but that leaves behind folds and thrust faults, which are not accounted for by that restoration. And thus, in this set of trenches, there are at least two paleo earthquakes on the Balakot Bog Fault, which, as they showed in their paper, have <clears throat> uh, return periods of probably in the neighborhood of 2,000 
uh, years or so. The 2005 earthquake took place here. And the second, the last event back took place anywhere between 200 and 2000 years ago. And then there's possibly an older event as well. So a fairly lo a long thousand year-ish return period between earthquakes. Okay, so I'm getting close to being able to summarize what I've shown you. First of all, in the Northwest Himalaya, we have uh, uh, the main Himalayan thrust extends from beneath the foreland into the hinterland. If we look at geodesy, that's this curve up here, which shows where interseismic strain is accumulating now beneath the Pir Panjal Kashmir Basin and farther to the north, the locking line for this profile would occur in this region here between 10 and 15 kilometers. If we look at the geological rates as shown by Jan and Chris, the SMA accounts for about six millimeters the Ryasi thrust accounts for about six millimeters, and the Kashmir Basin faults account for a millimeter or less of the shortening, which balances the geodetic rate that we measure in inner seismic, of inner seismic loading. If we turn to the Paleo earthquake history, what we see is in the available published data that exists right now shows one event, uh, from Aaron Hebler's thesis, one, three events uh, from Chris's thesis. The events are high, are considerably different in terms of their interval of time. This is one event in the last four and a half thousand years. This is three events in 30,000 years. Up in the uh, Japanese trench on the Balakot Bog Fault, we have at least two events in the last 2,000 years. And then given Chris's work on the Calabog Fault, we have one event in the last one and a half to 6,000 years. So a fairly Spartan record given the rate of convergence and the number of active faults um, on the map. So what does that mean about earthquake hazards in Pakistan? Well, I, I guess I'm, I would like to end by saying that, that uh, the salt range is the surface expression of the main Himalayan thrust. And there's a lot of debate in the literature about is the salt range capable of generating an earthquake? And what I would point out is that if you look at, 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 at Ghani's fine cross section uh, from his 2018 paper or from this very old paper by Baker uh, in 1988, both of them project the main Himalayan thrust to northward beneath the North Potwar deform zone. And I would point out that even once you're north of the North Potwar deform zone, you're only at depths of about seven or eight kilometers, well below, well, well shallower than the region in which there is strain accumulation. So if we want to know about the main Himalayan thrust and its locking and its potential for an earthquake, we actually have to look much farther to the north in terms of being able to constrain the rate at which strain is building on the main Himalayan thrust. And this is really a critical point because if you make a map of where the locking line is, that's this black dashed line or a guess of where it is, it's known under Kashmir from existing data. And this is simply a guess based on depth here in the north. These colored areas reflect the region of the MHT, which could potentially move in a large future earthquake in Pakistan. And what you notice is that that most of the, re all of the region between the salt range underneath the Peshawar Basin and farther to the north is underlain by a relatively shallow main Himalayan thrust that we know very little about its earthquake potential except for this one site on the Calabog Fault. And that's, uh, 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 tells us there was a paleo earthquake there, but it doesn't provide a very rich record of the longer term. And the other main point I would say is that there, the interference between the Northwest Himalaya and the Pakistan Himalaya, which has been, uh, there's been a lot of literature about this, but I did notice while reviewing the, the, for, the for the talk, Doug Burbank has a, a nice paper where he's showing how the facies and the depositional systems show the 
progressive interaction between the Northwest and the Pakistani Himalaya, that there is a main Himalayan thrust over here too, which is capable of generating an earthquake. And how these two parts of the same plate boundary communicate is, is uh, uh, I think, basically an unknown right now, and certainly unconstrained by uh, any geodetic data that would inform us as to how these pieces of the fault will uh, interact in the future. So thank you very much for taking the time to stay up late if you're uh, in America and getting up early if you're in Pakistan. And I'm quite happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was a magnificent talk. Would you like me to stop sharing? Uh, yes, yeah, please. you can if you just want people to see you and uh, interact more. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have a... So I have a, a question from uh, Adnan Alam. Can you please uh, unmute your mic? And it would be good to introduce yourself as well yes. so that we know that who we are interacting with. Adnan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, uh, topic indeed. I am uh, Adnan Alam Aman, serving as Director of Geological Survey of Pakistan, Islamabad. And uh, oh, uh, if you, uh, yeah, if you, you can uh, hear me. Yes, I can. Okay. Fine. And it's, it's very nice okay. to meet you. Okay, thank you. So, in fact, uh, Geological Survey Islamabad office uh, uh, is primarily uh, dealing into this seismic hazard assessment. Uh, well, uh, 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 coming on the topic, uh, uh, Yes, we all know that the locking line and uh, uh, there has been some uh, due to the uh, variation in coupling. Uh, now, the uh, uh, I mean, after the geodetic measurement, the data has completed some of the results. First, uh, I would like to comment on the salt range and port uh, As uh, in our recent uh, uh, publications or in few of the recent publications, uh, th there has been uh, a uh, uh, concluded conclusion that due to salt, uh, maybe the earthquake uh, does not uh, the earthquake along the MHT does not affect the salt range and port water. This is uh, one thing, and then uh, uh, the recent uh, data has also concluded that strong due to strong coupling uh, along the MHT and along locking line in the upper flat. Uh, probability of high magnitude earthquakes. I mean, this is these are the publications in 2020 and uh, 2021. If I just uh, uh, read the principal authors, uh, they are the Francois Johnny and uh, Stephen uh, G. Wesnowski, and the third is uh, uh, Mr. Somebody from the Russia, uh, Lucal Dal Zilio. So in this scenario, and uh, 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 on the topic as is today, uh, how would you like to incorporate these recent uh, uh, geodetic measurements, their conclusions, recommendations, and current earthquake scenario that is a high forecast in our uh, northern Pakistan, especially along the upper flat of the MHC? Thank you very much. Okay, that that thank you very much. First of all, for pointing out those publications, I I I, I will pursue them. Uh, and I'm not familiar with them, and I apologize for that. Um, I think probably that they uh, that well, first of all, with respect to the locking line, I think they're that they're they're likely to be arguing talking about the same basic problem that the MHT is a big fault, and where it stores strain and where it releases strain are in two different places. And knowing where that locking line is is quite important for figuring out what part of the shallow MHT will generate uh, earthquake in the future because earthquake size is a product of the slip in the event and the fault area. And fault area is informed by where that locking line is. Whether or not the, the salt range itself can store strain is unclear. I, I would say the, the literature is quite clear that it's a very weak decomment and that it is uh, and that there is some geodetic evidence for creep on the fault.
but there are plenty of examples globally of faults that have creeping-like behavior, which also generate large earthquakes. One example is the Hayward Fault in, in, in uh, San Francisco, California, which has a creeping shallow part of the structure, but nonetheless generates earthquakes on several hundred year time period, including one earthquake in 1868, I think it is. So the actual strength properties of the fault and whether they can generate earthquake are not, don't readily fall in one category or another. And I think it's, it, it's important to keep it open the possibility that the salt range, first of all, will move in a large earthquake on the MHT. And secondly, that it um, has potential for storing at least some of the strain that will be released in the future earthquake. Does that answer your question or did I sufficiently uh, yes. dodge it? Uh, yes, I mean, I mean uh, uh, yes, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just to, uh, to compliment, if you allow me, uh, and uh, yeah, introduce please. that. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, basically, GSP has, uh, we have measured 71 GNSS stations uh, for the last 15 years. Oh. Wow. Yes. The uh, Punjab top to uh, this uh, uh, salt range, and uh, we have one station in the Krana Hills as well. So, this is uh, one yeah. thing. And That's on, fabulous. Yeah, okay, thank you. And uh, uh, on this uh, data, we have published four uh, research articles I can share with you. Okay. Uh, I, yes. I would like to see those. I'm obviously behind on yes. my literature, for which I apologize. No, no, it's okay. It's okay, please. So uh, what is uh, we are uh, looking forward that basically GSP is now planning a complete uh, this uh, geodetic measurement uh, along all the major parts in the country. We have submitted a big project to the government and that is nearly going to approve. And after that, we are acquiring this permanent GSS station along with the episodics as well along the selected areas. So yes, this is an important. Good. Yes, thank you. So right from uh, our uh, northern uh, tectonics to the Chaman Fault and some areas along the south uh, of Pakistan, we intend to uh, now remire our, uh, we know that we have, there, there are data from the Blushistan University from Central of uh, Excellence of Shower. So yeah. definitely we have put forward a proposal to the government that all these uh, uh, researchers should come on a forum to share this GNSS data and the expertise. So this is, I mean, a brief introduction of our planning from Geological Survey Islamabad office. And uh, we are yeah. going to initiate it right uh, in uh, July this year, inshallah. Thank you. Well, yeah. I applaud you for that because uh, geodetic data are uh, the most critical uh, information that one can acquire for figuring out which faults are moving and what their loading rates are. So that's a that's a wonderful um, yeah, we are, uh, we are looking uh, research yeah. plan. Thank okay, you. so uh, we have the next uh, um, Mon Dr. Mona Lisa. Uh, can you oh. kindly unmute your? Yeah, Mona is there. So if you kindly unmute your uh, mic and uh, go on with your question, please. Dr. Mona Lisa, can you hear us? Her, her mic is still uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, you're fine now. Please okay. go on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very happy to see Andrew after such a long time. I think. Hello. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm all I'm right. So how are you? See, I'm very happy to see you. Uh, and uh, I must say, uh, first of all, I, I, I just convey my uh, best wishes and regards uh, to all my colleagues and uh, friends in Oregon State University, especially John and Bob Yeats and uh, Susan. And uh, I'm missing all of you uh, very much. And uh, I'm very happy and very excited to see you after such a long time. And uh, um, I'm hoping that in future we will uh, keep in contact. Um, I'm very happy and uh, 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 delighted to and uh, uh, um, it was a very wonderful talk um, and uh, you addressed uh, 
um, structural configurations in uh, Pakistani Himalayas, especially in Salt Range and in uh, Riasi Fault. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm greatly impressed uh, to see such a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, um, I have uh, just a, a, a very uh, a short question. Um, I just want to find out the role of uh, transpersonal uh, tectonics uh, in Pakistani Himalayas, especially um, um, as you know that uh, in Naga Parbat syntaxes, we are having two uh, uh, right lateral strike slip faults. Um, those are uh, Rykot fault and strike faults. And then again, we have uh, another syntaxis, um, which is Hazara Kashmir syntaxis, where we have yes. uh, GLM fault, which is again a strike slip fault. And then again, um, in salt range, uh, uh, near salt range thrust, as you mentioned very well, uh, that Kalaba fault, which is a very active fault. And once again, it is it is a strike slip fault. So um, I think uh, there there is a role of uh, strikes a fault, that is the transpersonal tectonic is also playing a very uh, active role uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, the production of uh, future major earthquakes. And uh, um, uh, along with the, the trans transpersonal tectonics, I must say that uh, uh, there are uh, some blind uh, uh, zones like Hazara lower seismic zone, Indus Kohistan seismic zone, these are very active zones and they are lying at a very shallow depth. As you see that um, um, in Kashmir Basin, uh, we have Balakot Bal Fall, which is a very active fault and which is, uh, I worked with Bob and uh, Ahmed Hussain um, and with you uh, when you were, uh, when you visited uh, uh, these areas in 2000, uh, after 2005 earthquake. And uh, we we uh, we see that uh, the this area is uh, uh, surface force that, that is the Balakot Bar fault is not only very active but at the same time Indus Khoistan seismic zone is playing a very active role in the generation of uh, earthquakes, especially shallow level earthquakes with having the depth of five to ten kilometers or fifteen kilometers, and uh, uh, along with uh, the shallow depths. These earthquakes are having uh, um, uh, the major uh, magnitude. That is, uh, we are expecting or we are experiencing the earthquake, especially in Hazara Kashmir syntax uh, area in Kashmir Basin. Um, a magnitude level of these earthquakes uh, is uh, above 6.5. Uh, and at the same time, these are uh, uh, we are experiencing seismicity at a very shallow level. Um, similar is the case uh, near Salt Range, uh, which is uh, again a very important and active deformational thr thrust. Here we are having uh, the earthquake with a magnitude uh, with uh, less uh, magnitude uh, uh, as compared to Hazara Kashmir syntax, uh, that is uh, uh, three or four, about four magnitude. Uh, we are uh, not experiencing. Uh, earthquakes with larger magnitudes like uh, greater than six or seven near salt range but we are expecting or uh, uh, we are forecasting on the basis of gps data and your uh, field studies and uh, your very comprehensive work that these are showing that um, at this this uh, this place especially near salt range uh, this area is very complicated uh, because we are experiencing uh, uh, the thick deposit of salt, which is uh, um, which is uh, playing uh, uh, an important role in um, uh, we we are unable to understand whether uh, the earthquake magnitude or low level of uh, occurrences of earthquake is due to the presence of salt or due to the unavailability of seismic stations, seismic sensors. Um, at this particular location, especially near Kalaba Fault, uh, because we, ha we are having some strategic uh, 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 locations here like a nuclear power plant near Chashma. So, so we are not having the data access, uh, seismic data access near uh, uh, Kalaba Fault. So uh, we, we are, as a seismologist, uh, 
uh, we are unable uh, to understand uh, the real cause of low frequency of earthquake near salt range, although it is a very active deformational front. So my, my query is actually is that what is the role of transpirational tectonic if in future uh, uh, major probable earthquake, especially near salt range? and uh, near Hazara Kashmir syntaxes and in Naga Prabha syntaxes, which are uh, having both uh, the transpirational tectonic, uh, they, are, they are having uh, the active thrust and reverse faults along with the strike slip faults. So uh, can you please uh, 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 discuss this or uh, comment on this yes. transpirational tectonic? Happily. And and I would just like to say that it's very nice to hear your voice again. And it uh, has been a long time since I have seen you. And it's very, I'm very happy to reconnect with you, Bonalisa. Thank you very much. Um, I, um, each one of those places has a geologically unique setting. And so there, it's quite difficult for me to put them all in the same box, if you will, in terms of my answer. So I'll mm -hmm. just go one at a time. Uh, the Kalabog Fault is linked to the salt range thrust in a way that allows the salt range to advance to the <laughs> south um, and the region immediately to the west um, relative to the med region immediately to the west. So clearly that fault is in is is tearing apart the the foreland basin and separating let's say the sawan syncline from the region uh where the indus river is flowing to the west of the fault and at the same time the uh seismic reflection data are quite clear that uh there are faults within the basement that are presumably precambrian in age because for example the salt itself is controlled by that those basement faults. So although I've characterized the Kalabog as having a simple ge geometry, there is certainly a possibility that it actually extends into the basement in addition to just having a surface expression. And so I wouldn't readily rule out that there is transpression that is uh, somewhat independent of the salt range, but I think from the point of view of uh, transpression there, most of the data basically says that the salt range is moving directly to the south, which would require, therefore, that the Kalabog fault is largely a uh, right lateral strike slip fault. And if there's any transpression, it would be where the fault changes its orientation relative to slip. At the other end of the spectrum, the Nanga Parbat region, that's uh, out of my level of expertise, and I only have a kind of a funny comment to make to you really there, and that's one that John Nabulik, who you know as a seismologist, is at my yeah. university, says to me every time I ask a question about an earthquake. He says, well, if an earthquake took place on it, it's a fault. So <laughs> the, my, point, my point is that if you have a transpressional focal mechanism in the Nanga Parbat massif related to the um, Rykote fault, then there must be a component of transpression there. And there, there has to be because both that syntaxis and the Hazara syntaxis are places where the Himalaya is at its most complicated because the northwestern Himalaya is moving to the southwest, whereas the Pakistani Himalaya is generally moving directly to the south. So there's interference between those two parts of the mountain belt that must be resolved in earthquakes somehow. And the kinematics must include some component of thrusting and some component of lateral motion, which may be manifested by the transpressional motion that you're describing. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the crust is just very complicated once you get to the north of the Paltwar deform zone because of the, of the seismic zones that you uh, referred to. The, the Hazara seismic zone, if I remember, an image of it is supposed to be a part of a, a, a broken fault a broken plate system where the whole Indian plate is cracked basically at that place. So there, there are just fundamental things that I, I don't think I understand well enough to really be that uh, 
uh, smart in my answer. My main point that I wanted to make is that, and, and it sounds like it maybe doesn't need to be made, is that the, the main Himalayan thrust is a very large low angle fault. And mm -hmm. elsewhere in the Himalaya, faults with that geometry generate the largest earthquakes, but they're also associated with very low level of seismicity because they're not moving now, they only move seismically. Yeah, yeah. Very well said. Uh, thanks, Andrew. And uh, 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 one Thank thing you. I would like to uh, uh, inform uh, my colleagues, uh, especially Dr. Irfan and Bob and uh, Andrew yourself. Uh, we have, uh, I have recently uh, established an earthquake lab in Islamabad in Gaidiyazm University oh. with the help of HEC. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. And we have installed uh, uh, nine uh, strong motion uh, uh, sensors and uh, uh, 10 weak motion sensors. This is the biggest uh, 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 seismological lab on uh, university level in Pakistan. And uh, our main aim is to uh, uh, find out uh, the uh, seismic city, especially uh, in capital city and in 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 Hazara Kashmir in Texas, especially. Uh, so I think yeah. uh, this uh, this uh, lab will definitely help uh, us a lot. Uh, most recently, we yeah. are experiencing a very uh, uh, high frequency of earthquake in Islamabad. Uh, the real time data of this lab is showing that mm -hmm. there is a high frequency of low magnitude earthquakes. This is very strange mm -hmm. that frequency is very high in Islamabad on the basis of this these this lab data, but their their magnitude is quite low. Means uh, they are showing the micro seismicity. Their magnitude is lesser than three, uh, which is which is uh, which is uh, uh, debatable and uh, definitely. Um, um, I, I wish that uh, Andrew, uh, I, uh, you, and uh, uh, John uh, um, uh, can work on it and find out the cause of this high uh, micro level seismicity uh, in Islamabad. Yeah. Yeah. Thank well, you. I'm so very encouraged you. by both. Uh, I'm encouraged by hearing that and by hearing that the GSP is a, uh, actively involved in a large collection of, of geodetic data because those kinds of uh, measurements, both earthquakes and geodetic data are absolutely essential for characterizing uh, the location and importance of different seismic hazards. Yeah, yeah it's, it's wonderful news. Uh, we, we have a question from Adnan Aramala. I want OK, uh, well, thank you. Uh, Mukhtar Ghani, if I, I may share my screen, uh, I think yes, it, yeah. I would open share screen, right? Yeah. Yes. And just uh, okay. click the arrow button. Okay. Uh, so, so can you see my screen now? Uh, we, we are, uh, yes, we can see. Okay. So, uh, oh. I mean, uh, just if you allow contributing in the discussion that is going on, that. Yeah. Uh, you see, this is our data of uh, Franco's journey uh, at all 2020. And here, uh, yes. Indus Kwestan seismic zone is uh, showing strong coupling. And uh, same same is uh, as, uh, the data somewhere around Islamabad and the Naga Parbat Haramosh Massive, uh, definitely along yeah. the Raikou. So strong coupling there. And uh, uh, this, uh, our article was uh, reviewed by Roger Billum. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, other uh, second author. And uh, now the screen I am sharing that this is uh, the recent publication of pending building the Himalayas from tectonic to earthquake. And you, you see the northwestern Himalaya is again uh, highlighted as strong coupling. So the maximum uh, color is yeah. the maximum <coughs> size uh, risk. Uh, and another. Uh, a recent publication that is the great pending Himalayan earthquakes. So, uh, and here we see that uh, a series of trenching has been uh, processed by the Indian geological, uh, I mean, this, uh, earth sciences uh, researchers. And they have uh, find out uh, these reoccurrence along certain specific fault lines. So, I mean, the, the this is uh, true uh, that as Dr. Mona Liza has said that there are, there is a frequency of earthquake, uh, 
uh, in surrounding of Islamabad, but they are of low magnitude. Yes, it is interesting that uh, we have only one historical reference earthquake in our this Islamabad, and that is the Tesla 24 AD earthquake. And if we plot its epicenter, it is in fact near uh, D12 and Shah Aladdita sectors of Islamabad. So definitely we know that its magnitude was from 7.6 uh, to 7.8 something. So th this is the only historical reference we have. And uh, all the data that was on the basis of before the invent of the geodetic and after that is totally uh, matching, I would say that uh, towards the strong coupling and uh, high sensitivity uh, potential in the area. And few of the uh, authors have clearly even indicated the numerical, I mean the structure uh, magnitude, moment magnitude, where they have said that it is about eight uh, somewhere in the upper flat of the uh, our uh, MHD. So upper flat, we all know that this is uh, this uh, region, Islamabad and industrial Islam seismic zone and somewhere along the locking line. So definitely, uh, I just, uh, uh, I mean, remarked to, to uh, agree with the discussion that is uh, going on. Thank you very much. Well, I would make I would make two points. First of all, the coupling map that you're showing is extremely important because it's those areas that are coupled that will provide the uh, slip in the future earthquake. And thus you can figure, you can make an estimate of the size of the earthquake by figuring out the size of that area. And presumably that's what Juan did in this article. The other thing I would say about the um, figure that you showed with all those trench sites is that's, that, that map is a, is, shows you the science progress in the Himalaya since about 1999 when the first trench was dug in the Himalaya. And it's an impressive growth of information, but you notice that it's once you hit the Northwestern Himalaya in Kashmir and in Pakistan, the density of in knowledge drops off enormously. And that is a really uh, a significant um, uh, window of opportunity for future work is to try to improve that paleoseismic record. Uh, towards the regions in the West in your country where the same kinds of information uh, don't exist with anything like what you're showing on this map. Those are very important points. Yes. That you yes. raise. Yes. Thank you very much. And we are uh, looking forward to build up a future strategy. I mean, the Earth Sciences in Pakistan and GSP strategy to work on this specific issue because once the alert is there, I mean, high uh, seismic information uh, indication based on the data is there, then uh, uh, interaction and collaborated efforts are required locally yeah. and with the national community. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I think, Andrew, there is, uh, that was pretty much it. We don't have any other questions. Uh, from the audience. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know if Bob is around, but uh, I think yes. it's time to conclude. Yes, he's here. Yeah. No. Oh, I, I think uh, it's it's wonderful to hear the the breadth of work that's been done uh, by so many different people, and uh, I think the connection here between the the research that that Andrew and your colleagues have done in the past and the work that's now being started. Uh, both by the GSP and Qadi Azam in uh, Islamabad, is, is there's a wonderful connection there. And I think that there are opportunities that might come in the, in the future, uh, again, for collaboration, where possibly, uh, you know, students from the United States and students from Pakistan could yeah. work together. And uh, it would be useful. And, and in fact, of course, to have the students from India as well. Yes. And, uh, yeah. You know the the plate boundaries don't know where the international boundaries are, no. And so yeah, so, no knowledge. True, and and yeah. and we're all deeply concerned about seismic risk. I mean, I think that's a topic that's come up several times in the conversation, and we might have one or two more seminar series about that because I think that one of the you know we we talk about the shawalik sediments as being synorogenic, meaning they're happening at the same time as the orogeny, and we usually use the shawalik sediments as a record of mountain building, well, the mountains are still being built and, and that's being yes, felt. Yes, they are. Earthquakes. So uh, 
I think it's a wonderful contribution to our series, Andrew, and uh, thank you all uh, for participating. And I invite you all to come a week from now. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Kay Berensmeyer, who has uh, worked for many years on uh, studying the record of life in the rock units in, in Pakistan and other parts of the world, will give a talk that will involve uh, uh, reconstruction of paleoecology and paleo landscapes following on the work that uh, Catherine Badgley talked about and John Barry talked about. So we'll see you all uh, next week. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 yeah. Dr. Mona, I want to add some. Certainly, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I must say that I'm, I'm very grateful to Irfan and Bob. Um, uh, you people are, are doing great and uh, uh, this is my first interaction, and uh, I'm, 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 uh, I just uh, s see the name of Andrew, and uh, I can't help myself to uh, <laughs> participate in this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, marvelous uh, discussion. And uh, I, I think uh, we must collaborate, uh, GSP and uh, Peshawar University and Kairism University and uh, Oregon State University, um, to uh, improve uh, the seismic risk or seismic hazard assessment uh, mapping of Pakistan, especially, uh, which is due. And and uh, I think uh, uh, we must uh, collaborate. And, um, I, and I must say, I I I uh, I, I congratulate uh, Irfan and uh, Bob, especially to you uh, that you have you are doing wonderful job. And uh, I'm very happy to see Andrew after such a <laughs> uh, long time. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, in future we will uh, keep in contact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mona Lisa. Good to see you here. Thank you. I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I think uh, that's the time to say goodbye and see you in the upcoming seminar. Uh, we are looking Excellent. forward. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good night or a good morning. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank Goodbye. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Irfan. Thank you, Andrew, very much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. See you later, Bob. Yeah, we'll talk Take some care. more. We'll talk some more. So, uh, Thank you.